Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this event for the Entangled Festival. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and um, a good way to start a Friday night. Um, so I'm Harriet Fraser and this is Rob Fraser of Somewhere Nowhere. We've been part of the ensemble team for the last five years and um, it's a real pleasure to bring together some other people for a conversation tonight about art and artists and data and environmental research. Um, before we start, I just want to say, please do use the chat um, to share your, your views and your thoughts. Um, Will will post in the chat um, any relevant website links so you know how to access other elements of the festival because it's all going to be available online, apparently in perpetuity. Forever. However long that is. Um, so, um, yeah, we're going to have an open conversation tonight. Um, beginning with a presentation where each, each person from the panel is going to share a little bit of their work that they've chosen to share tonight. But we'll just begin um, by asking for an introduction from the panel members. Um, so Daksha, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everybody, my name's Daksha. I'm an interdisciplinary artist and I often work with science and science researchers. Um, and um, some ongoing themes in my practice are mapping. My, my, the work that you'll see is all about mapping and measurement. So ideas about data and data visualization. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Thank Daksha. You. So next on the spotlight is Edwina. Hello everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm an artist, I'm a researcher, I'm a lecturer, um, so I have many hats on. I'm, I've been working in forests for the last ooh, 20 years, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today in relation to the land and how we understand the land. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. And last but no means least, come on down, Richard. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Richard Pamal. Uh, I'm the director of Art.Earth, and I'll put that link in the chat. Um, uh, interesting, actually, that you're talking about maps, because I'm kind of talking about maps as well. So we'll come back to that. Brilliant. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know us, um, Rob and I work at Somewhere Nowhere, and our art practice brings together photography and poetry. And really, we look at the intersection between lots of different elements in our, in our shared environment. OK, here we go with the tech scary bit. What I'm going to do now, everybody, is I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to start uh, a Pecha Kucha session. So each of the three um, people here, including us, so there'll be four of us, will be going through five images, talking about them for 30 seconds each. It's a bit like some game show without the kind of big prize at the end, but here we go. So that's us. Uh... Daksha, tell me when you're ready and I'm going to press the button and you'll be going first, please. Ready. This is a screenshot from Modeling Morecambe Bay, which is a new animation commission for uh, responding to environmental modeling research at Lancaster University and part of the um, Entangled Festival. The research models and predicts futures, for instance, the effects of climate change upon locality by using a variety of data sets, algorithms and modeling. And so my animation merges images of Morgan Bay with drawings inspired by environmental models, which are animated by creative coding. Ooh. Can you see, can you see the second print? We've missed a print in the middle. I'll jump to this one. Uh, no, there's a second one, sorry. Okay, great. Uh, so this is a large scale print upon fabric, a commission for the Horniman Museum in London. And this was responding to themes of water pollution. The print merges satellite imagery and eco maps of the Sundarbans mangrove forests in Bangladesh, home to many endangered species such as the Bengal tiger. Drawings of fauna and flora at risk uh, in the region are hidden within the map in the colorful kind of the same colors as, as, as the map. So they are literally disappearing from the surface, from its surface. So people have to look very hard to find them. Okay, I think we've skipped another one, but this is fine. This is one of a series of five drawings shown upon light boxes at Piccadilly train station in Manchester. And this was in response to air pollution 
um, in the region, so air pollution mapping and data sets. So this drawing merges internal body imagery of lung tissue, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, with maps of the orbital motorway surrounding um, Manchester. They sort of resemble arteries or veins in the bottom of the image. I'll go back to the other one. There you okay. go. Yeah, All sorry. right. So this Apology. one is a detail from a drawing made with different clays um, and water using a very fine brush. It represents parts of Newcastle at risk of flooding, modelled by researchers at the university who were mapping data about weather patterns and flood risk areas in the region. The drawing was inspired by photographs of the city after floods with buildings with a thin line of a kind of um, clay along the walls marking the rising level of the water. And um, the drawings were exhibited at Gallery North in Newcastle. And the final one. And this is final one. This is an exhibition in a museum in the Pena Garcia region of Portugal, uh, a, a result of a residency in this very mountainous and incredibly rural area, which was in going, uh, undergoing desertification. So these, I call them light drawings, were made by making little pinpricks in detailed maps of pathways in the mountains that I've been walking along, which connected sort of these little hamlets and houses together. And they literally projected through an OHB, very old fashioned technology. Thank you. <laughs> wow, thank you. I want to see each one of those enormous. Yeah. Edwina, are you ready? I'm ready. Am I muted or am I back on? So no, we can hear you. So I'm going to press the button now. OK, deep breath. Right. I'm going to talk about two projects, one of which has been completed, which is the Archive of the Trees. And that was for Furman Woods Contemporary Arts in a Forest Commission woodland called Fine Shade. So that was a mixture of ancient woodland and tree farm, I guess. And this is a tree core that I took with um, University of Swansea's geography department. Um, they've been doing an oak, um, UK oak project. So we work together on this and collaboration is very much part of my practice. So this is a tree core and it took two forms. Um, well, what actually, I should actually explain why I was taking tree cores. Um, I'm interested in how I can use scientific data, particularly to do with climate change and the idea of human data and anecdote and how they fuse together. So to try and give the landscape its own agency to communicate what it's been through. So the tree cores show the growth each year of, of the, um, the plant. So, for example, in 1976, which was a drought year, most of the trees barely grew. So that was really clearly revealed. So there was a mixture of human anecdote about um, climate change and extreme weather and the landscape in general. There was data to do with weather on them. And then there was the data to do with um, the actual tree itself. So first of all, the trees that were cored were wrapped. Oh, I'm way behind. Bunch of one um, weight. Okay. And, um, they were shown both within the forest with the wraps and also as a gallery context, as you can see. So you're walking through it. Um, yeah, let's, can you move it on, Rob? Thank you. Um, this is the second project. It is um, very much in progress. It's a video work. And it's Whitman's Wood, which is in Dartmoor. And while it's been owned for centuries, it's a very contested and refused to be managed and owned. Um, and again, this agency and this idea of archiving a place, if you will, this is a place that I don't feel should be revealed fully. So this is triarted all the way through. So you get glimpses. Um, Robin Wall Quimera talks about the land holding the past, present and the future simultaneously. And I felt that very strongly when I was there. So I'm really quite struggling with this about how I can depict, depict this extraordinary place. Um, and give it voice and agency. And, and perhaps this is another form of archive in that respect. Cool. Perfect. Well done, Edwina. Thank you. Thank you. Richard, are you ready? I am ready. And I'm really interested that we just looked at Westman's Wood. Me too. Yeah, because... I recognise it straight away. Yeah, yeah. because actually... The, the park some some years ago, some quite long time ago, divided it in two, literally put a fence mm. in the middle of it to stop 
um, not just humans, but grazing animals coming to see what the landscape would look like if uh, if it wasn't grazed. Uh, and it has changed dramatically now between one side or the other. But that's by the by, I don't have time for that. We um, but in the that. end, oh, me, right, I'm going to press the button for now. me. Oh, you haven't started yet. Go on, no. go on, go ahead and start then. There you go. You're on. You have to, I have to re restart my uh, doobie now. OK, there we go. So for me, it, this, all of this is really about maps. So interesting that Daksha was talking about maps because uh, I'm not going to show work. I'm going to talk about um, what I was asked to talk about, which is about kind of working together across many different disciplines and the work that Art the Earth does. And for, for me, maps kind of help us understand and take us on our journeys. So, but they're also highly codified. They're a, they are a very codified language um, and we need to understand what that language is. But there are commonalities too. If you're talking about being working across disciplines, everybody has a map, everybody has. Uh, also their, their work is also rooted very much in passion and in discovery. So whatever our discipline happens to be, um, we've all, we all share those same goals. We all share those same same uh, kind of methods of working in a way. Um, so the maps, uh, whatever that map happens to be, kind of helps us share uh, understanding. So, but how do we um, uh, share those understandings beyond our own very comfortable world? Uh, we're all, we all live in specialized worlds and we tend to communicate with others in those special worlds. So what can we do? as artists to speak outside um, those very limited walls. So there are there are things we can do and I'd love to be able to talk about that later on this afternoon. Um, so we're all in, is in the business of thinking about binaries of thought. Let's not think, forget too about the other than human world. So much of uh, what uh, we all do, academics, artists, scientists, whatever, tends to be very focused, uh, very anth anthropically focused, if that's the right word. Uh, we forget too much about the other species we share the planet with, um, who are probably as expert at living as we are. Uh, some would say more so, because um, if you think about it, some species have been here a great deal longer than we have without destroying the landscape. And my time is up with a big fat zero. So I'm going to stop there. That felt like it was a metaphorical declining of species, yeah. actually. So thank you for that. <laughs> OK, and it's us last. So here we go. Um, a great deal of our work over the last 10, 11 years has been basically about getting outside, uh, using any excuse through any of the research we do um, to get in touch with the landscape, to get a feel for place. Uh, we call it data of the heart by being out, particularly in the Lake District, uh, where we're largely based. But being out there on a night like this to experience the stars above you is to feel humble. Um, and to collect data, data through writing, data through images, and, and just the experience of weather. And also our work is about collaboration, about bringing ideas, seeds and ideas. We interviewed David Nash a few years ago and he used the phrase as, as seeds as ideas and where one uh, idea from a project working with trees leads to this, where you put a big banner around it as part of an installation. And then you invite a friend who happens to play a cello from London to come up and actually do a mini performance uh, in front of the installation. Uh, we're very much getting into activism with a small a these days. I think it's no longer good enough for artists, creatives or, or people in general, I think, to sit on the fence, uh, you know, climb down off the fence in a, in a very obviously non-violent, non-judgmental way and actually say what's going wrong and what's happening. This is a collaboration with the Woodland Trust and the Banbury Ornithological Society. Uh, marking a woodland that's due to be destroyed by HS2. And we used 108 yellow cloths wrapped around the trees to represent the woods that are going to be destroyed. Um, this is a, a little insight into some of the work I've done with um, Vatsala Nandol from the ensemble team taking survey responses and trying to visualize uh, verbal data and emotional data really. And then we put it through uh, a bespoke computer program to see if the computer could write poetry. Um, and it can't, but it tries. And one of the phrases it came out with is loss is quiet management, a lonely silence. 
And this is the final one. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. This was uh, the first time we met Professor Gordon Blair, who's part of the ensemble team. We were involved in a project in the Conway Valley, uh, looking at putting sheep um, sensors on the back of sheep to measure real time data. But being us, we wanted to walk up to the top of the valley and also down to the seaside to uh, follow the course of the Conway yes, River. Give Gareth the last word. So the last word is going to Gareth. So this was a, a short she doesn't call it a poem, but Harriet wrote a poem in English and then Gareth translated it into Welsh and then read it. So here we go. Ah. Oh. Uh, there you go. Didn't work. Oh. <laughs> you nearly got a Welsh nearly poem. Nearly got a Welsh poem. It's very short. I'm going to try it again. Shall I try it again? <laughs> One second. Yeah, go on, try again. It's so beautiful. Let's yeah. try again. Lle mae'r afon yn llifo, lle mae'r ddafad yn mynd, beth allwn ei wybod, a allwch glasau pryd, a allwch deimlo'r niw, mae pob dim yn gysylltiedig, hyn a hwn a hon. There you go. So th thank you everybody for for sharing your slides i'm aware for, for people here that that's um quite an eclectic bunch there's a lot to take in and it's a rapid fire way of introducing a lot of different ideas so we'll take the rest of the evening to maybe look into some of those ideas in more detail and please anybody who's listening if you're curious about anything pop it in the chat and we will try and field that um the action may have to leave before the end of the evening. So just to let you know if she disappears, um, it's probably not an internet glitch and we just want to thank you in advance, Daksha. But with that in mind, um, just wanted to start off by asking you if you could explain a bit of your process behind your response to the idea of modelling in, in Morecambe Bay. So um, it's always a journey when you get when you start on a new project um, and uh, you, you kind of explore different ideas and, and um, eventually you find your way through. So I initially um, uh, Gordon sent me some papers, which were um, I found really fascinating um, and uh, something sort of stuck in my mind, some phrases really stuck in my mind from reading those papers and this idea of models of everywhere models of everything and models at all times. It's almost poetic. Um, and this idea that they're constantly being evaluated naturally that uh, you, you tend to think of modeling as this kind of, I don't know, a very logical process that happens in a computer, but actually what they were saying was modeling was a learning process for them. And that was fascinating for me. Um, and then they talked about something called digital twinning. And that was quite, you know, it's like all these images come in your mind, you know, it's twinning, sort of the idea of the twin is such a powerful thing anyway, not to practice, but then the digital twin. Um, and I started with, um, I think we started with literally maps. We knew that it was around Morecambe Bay that they had this data and um, that they wanted to focus around that area. So they sent me a number of maps and you have to do two things. You have to make an idea come alive visually as well as sort of conceptually, you, you have to find that. And it's, it's it, it just sudden, you know, you, you have to look for it and you recognize it when you see it. Um, in the papers, there were a lot of examples of models, different types of visualizations, which I work with a lot. I mean, I've worked with visualizations of bodies, for instance, um, using different types of technologies. But here, there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of contour lines. There were a lot of noughts and crosses. And there were a lot of squares, there were a lot of kind of um, sort of grid like structures, which constantly changing. So I kind of decided that that was going to be my kind of visual language. Um, and to animate that, um, I decided to work with a coder, a creative coder who I've worked with before. Um, and it seemed really relevant for this project because what they are doing is manipulating lots and lots of data and, and using different alg algorithms to kind of make sense of it and looking at it in different ways to interpret it. So um, Chris Ball, who is the coder, um, I sent him a number of different drawings, which were sort of, they were literally pencil drawings. Um, and um, he developed something called a line follower. So I would say, well, I want this line to come in from this direction and this one to come in from that direction. And um, I broke down each drawing into four or five um, kind of layers as it were. And he um, 
wrote this code, which was literally a line follow. It's almost like I've seen it when it's a, a thing in itself. It looks like a little insect. It's got three eyes, one in front, one in right and left. And basically when it, the, it sees a line, whichever bit sees a line, if the right eye sees a line, it goes towards it. If there's a lot of confidence, it goes really fast. If it's not sure, it kind of goes around a bit in circles. And so what's happened is the lines then become very, very organic. And um, they kind of have an agency of their own as well. You're not quite sure where they're going to go. Um, so that's, that's the process I went through. And then it was another layer of editing in um, using Final Cut Pro as kind of um, editing software, playing around with colors, transparencies, and finding those images as well, those kind of very kind of recognizable images of Morecambe Bay, which I which were literally from photo library. They were all colored images. I just changed them all to black and white to layer the, the lines on top. So that was my process. Brilliant. Well, oh, thank you. For those of you who haven't seen um, Dacha's animation, it is on the Entangled Festival website. And, and you can see these lines coming to life. And Will's just put the, the link up in the, uh, the yeah, chat. So there it is. thanks. And I, and I was going to pick up on what you, uh, the idea of the digital twin and the way I understood it when Gordon talked about modeling and digital twins for the felt and experienced environment. And I, I personally find the leap between my felt reality and a digital twin, quite a hard one to make, is, is the idea of a twin. Um, I don't know, Richard or Edwina, if you have any observations or any questions for Daksha around her work with the digital. I, I, I was just clicking on the, uh, to look at the animation now. It sounds sounds beautiful. And, and that, that kind of notion of, of trying to follow a line, but not being entirely sure and kind of, uh, you know, looking around and going, feels very, feels very human and, uh, or feels very uh, organic rather than human. And um, I think what's um, lovely, I to, go on. Yeah. Um, Gordon talked a lot about the uncertainties in the process yeah. as well. That was really lovely because scientists don't often talk about uncertainty. No, they should talk about it more. Yeah, they may not use the word uncertainty. It'll be a different term, but they like to couch it in terms of, um, I suppose, confidence. Confidence, yes, whether it's going to turn out yeah. or not, especially with modelling. Well, they should be talking about unconfidence. Unconfidence. You're yes. on mute there, Edwina. I was just saying, you know, we, we are so used to this idea of a map being a fixed thing, whether it's you know, because they go back to this idea of terra incognita and are very much bound up with colonialism, but I like this idea of a dynamic map that rewrites itself and palimpsests itself. It almost feels that that's the way to counteract the kind of power that goes with the mapping. And, and actually, in many ways, there's no reason now why, why maps shouldn't do that. Um, uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't actually rewrite themselves constantly. I worked with a cartographer years ago who said a map is out of date the moment it's printed. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's true. Uh, but with digital mapping, you know, especially with LIDAR mapping and everything else, there's no reason why Morgan Bay couldn't be represented uh, by, by the second, because it does change by the second. Mm. Yeah. Yes, yes. Because maps are, I mean, essentially about creating borders and fit off to, they are fixed borders. Um, and so I think, yes, when you have this kind of data map and digital map and modeling, it can become a fluid border, which is far more exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of fluidity and um, it can take away from being hung up on the idea of certainty or a final answer or something that you can settle with long term and just to be open for more conversations to come in or more perspectives and that also brings us on to the perspectives of the non-human which um, I know for all of you and, and for us is is very important and it's something you particularly wanted to speak about Richard. Yeah I mean I think um, uh, for me uh, it's it is everything and I think we forget you know we 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 We've come to lionize uh, the landscape and, and nature, and we 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 tend to think of that as being um, um, being with beautiful shapes and plants that grow. And we often forget about all of the life forms that are inhabiting it and are changing it constantly and are living in it and are um, living off it. There's no reason why we can't live off the land in that sense. 
Um, uh, and I think it's, I think it's, I just think it's really hard to lose our um, anthropocentric um, uh, viewpoint. I think we do it so automatically when we, when we talk about everything that uh, it would be interesting to kind of force yourself for one day to not put the human at the center. And just what would that mean? What would that actually, you know, to, this is this uh, festival is about entanglement. The, uh, the world we live in is, is extraordinarily entangled uh, and we don't see most of it. And partly we don't see it because we're never still enough to actually watch it. So, you know, one of the very special things that we have done with a wonderful artist called Tony Whitehead is we do overnight sits by the River Dart. Um, and that is literally about sitting. It doesn't matter if you go to sleep. It doesn't matter if you do whatever you like. It doesn't matter if you get up and leave. But if you sit there long enough, not only do, do your eyes adjust so you start to see things, but you, you start to hear things. And if you sit there long enough and you're still, some of those creatures of the night will come out to investigate you. What are you doing there, you alien creature? Um, that's about stillness. That's about letting the, the world speak to you. And that's what we so often just don't have time to do. And in fact, we did a great deal more when we were locked down. That's so many true. people commented on that that yeah, yeah. suddenly they heard the world very differently and they began to see the world differently. That's the same with our art practice as well in, in many respects, Richard. We, we call it the power of the pause of going somewhere just to be, to sit and then wait for what happens, you know, by, by that non-movement, if you like, things come to you, including the weather in Cumbria. Yeah. <laughs> the weather comes, the weather goes. Ah, um, ah. Just, just to sit in a space and then with no particular outcome, thought through uh, and then well, you do that quite a bit yeah and something happens on an energetic level as well as the, the kind of the sure. object, subject perspective there's something about the flow that changes yeah, yeah. The uh, of time and place and relationships yeah. so it's a very for a lot of people a very important part of life let alone art practice um, mm -hmm. and Edwina you talked about agency in terms perhaps with, within the forest setting and I wondered if you wanted to add anything um, I think kind of going, thinking about Richard's point about how we take the anthropocentric out of the equation. I've been reading a lot of North American um, takes on the world. Um, you know, the, the, the use of storytelling, the use of metaphor seems to be very powerful. And how we name things as well. It's, they make it, Robin Wall Kimmerer again, kind of makes the point if we were to chop a tree down, if it was called him or her, mm. instead of it, we'd have a very, very different relationship with it. Um, and I like this kind of, the, the, the stories about many, many centuries ago, we all spoke the same language, all creatures. And yet we've now, we're starting to look, well, for a long time, we've been speaking a very, very different language to all the kind of creatures that are around us on this planet. Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond to that, Edwina, because I think if you if you look at uh, even even as a, as little as four hundred years ago, for the Enlightenment, possibly is what we're talking about. Actually, for Descartes, um, uh, the animal world was so much more a part of our everyday, not just our, our language, our narrative, our imagery. It was all you know the the animal world. We were part of the animal world. We existed with it, and I think. The combination of urbanization and the separation of body and mind has somehow left us. You know, the Enlightenment had lots going for it, but it did did kind of put man very much at the center and started to forget everyone else. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to go that far back before you see that, and and even the notion of a shared language. I so think, yeah, I completely agree with you. Yeah. yeah, so the irony of this conversation is that we're in the middle of a, a festival about digital and uh, digital data collection and using digital interfaces and modeling in a way that tries to help us better understand. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious um, about the perspective of looking at this disconnect or this inability to understand languages 
of others that we share the planet with and where the digital might help with that. Um, and I'm kind of looking at you, Daksha, because you've got a lot in with digital work and digital patterning. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, given that we are in a digital age. Um, I My work tends to, I think it's always moves from analog to digital and often back again. It's never just the one thing. And I think for me, that's the, that's the essential part. And I'm really interested in digital work that actually um, feels as though it's a little bit embodied and it's got, um, it's got an agency and it's got a kind of liveliness about it. That's the kind of digital work that I find more exciting to work with. And I think it, yeah, because actually we are, our, life, we, our lives are totally enmeshed in the digital. Everything we do interfaces with it. So we can't really, totally separate ourselves from it. It's about kind of um, making it a part of ourselves. Um, yeah, making it lively, I think, rather than something that's totally separate. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, it absolutely makes sense. I, I think digital is obviously here to stay uh, for the next while, um, but I still think that there's that need to try and step away from it. I, I use obviously digital, not obviously, but I do use digital through my photography gathering. You know, I'm collecting pixels in the back of a sensor in that way. But it still takes me to actually have the, the eye to see, as it were, to, to record it, to collect it in whatever form I can. Um, so it's become a, a tool for what I'm trying to do to then trying to get across the emotional side of what I'm, I'm gathering. That's where my work personally is going now. It's more about a feeling of space and place rather than a a documentary take on a landscape to sort of open up conversations about where we fit with all of this. Um, so that's kind of where I'd like my work to travel over the next few years. I'm thinking about making a giant camera, uh, a pinhole camera, and not to record anything faithfully, that's not the idea at all, but just to play with something and the act of carrying that into the landscape to then make these single images of a place and then have it to respond to that in her own way, just to, to bring it back to that. Richard, you got your hand up. Uh, just, just to say that um, I'm a, a recent convert to sailing, and sailing is a really interesting combination. When you're out on the boat, it's a really interesting combination of the digital and the real. Because um, I, you know, the, what's the most important thing when you're sailing? The wind. Okay, so uh, right in front of me, I've got this, you know, nice graph which is full of lots of digital data showing me where the wind is, but I can feel it too, and sometimes. The, what, how, where you feel it coming from is much more important or, or maybe it's simply backed up by this screen that's in front of you, but actually feeling it, feeling where the wind is coming from, feeling where the waves are, doing it all very anal in a very <laughs> analog manner uh, uh, is key. And it's that, that's really interesting to me that, you know, here we are on the boat surrounded by all of this data and actually, what when you come down to it, um, it's how it feels. Go, Daksha. I'm just going to say quickly that data is information. So information can come in binary format, uh, traditional, what we now know data to be. But of course, data comes from whatever the derivation is. It is it information? Probably somebody might be Greek. Greek yeah. <laughs> but it is it, data is what you're just collecting through through your body, essentially. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Daksha. No, that's fine. Um, I just remembered while you were speaking, Richard, um, so an example of, of that kind of movement of, between digital and kind of a, um, making it embodied. So I, I, showed, I did some training in coding before recently, because I felt if I'm collaborating with a coder, I need to understand his process. Now he's been doing it for 20 years. Mine was very simple, but <laughs> I managed to make a little red ball and a green ball kind of ping and bounce across the room and that was all done by writing lots of like numbers and brackets and bits mm. of code you know but what I found is initially I was very very I was doing everything very literally really making sure I got my my kind of all my symbols in the right place but surprisingly but after a few weeks I started working I could quite intuitively without code and I never thought that would, I didn't really didn't think that would happen Mm. Um, and there's something where you um, put in a, a series of numbers literally to create colors. And it wasn't long before I was just playing with that and trying mixes of colors. And in, in my head, I could say, oh, yeah, that's going to be a lime green. 
that one's going to be a hot orange. I don't know if that was much different from paint, you're getting a paintbrush out and mixing mm. different colors together. It felt that intuitive. Um, so maybe, um, that, yeah, that's where I want to get to when I'm working with digital media, that kind of uh, relationship. Edwina? I'm kind of trying to bring two thoughts together with this about the digital and its relationship with an archive, given that, you know, there's mass extinction going on in that respect. But I'm also interested in this idea of um, digital and the data. And there's a lot of conversations, you know, they talk about, well, one talks about, you know, the difference between data, information and knowledge. But that's still a kind of flow that's very much of the enlightenment. And a lot of the things that I've been hearing about recently is about the idea of, can we replace the idea of knowledge with the idea of wisdom? Mm. Because it's more inclusive and because it takes us away from that Cartesian idea. And I love this idea of cultural wisdom. I love the idea of collective wisdom. I love the idea of animal wisdom. Yeah, I, I, I like what you're saying. It's I was just going to say that listening to everybody speak, I think we're all talking about collaboration in different ways. And if you look in the chat, um, Will's been putting some things in there about maps and how maps are okay, but they, they, they never really work on their own. There has to be some interpretation, um, assistance along the way. And it's like the human comes in to interface with the digital information to help make sense of it and you've been referring to Robin Wall Kimmerer's work um, and I've read her recent book Braiding Sweetgrass and she she talks very beautifully about humans and other species as an entwined entangled coexistence oh sorry bye 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 thank bye everyone thank, thank, you. thank you speak to you again yeah um and this idea that it's a coexistence and not a hierarchical relationship, I think, is, is something to do with wisdom and listening and bringing in different perspectives, maybe that you sense in a forest, perhaps, very well, um, which is why you, you pick up on it. So maybe from, from that, because I know, you know, we have other themes to talk about. Um, we haven't even got to question one yet, We haven't even yet, really guys. looked at all the questions. <laughs> that, that idea well, come of, on, get on with it. <laughs> So collaboration and working in teams and what that does um, as an artist or within an arts practice, uh, why is it important to work in teams and, and how can we, we perhaps make that work to have the effect of getting beyond the echo chambers of people who are already listening anyway? Andrina, you want to? Um, I absolutely think collaboration is important. I think this idea of the singular voice in relationship with the land is a very problematic one. Um, I really like cross-disciplinary collaborations. I think they, those discussions that you have with other people about these assumed perspectives and how you are entering into this place, if you will, is... I just get a huge amount from it. And I've heard, I've talked at conferences before now where artists have kind of said that they're very worried and wary about working with scientists, but truthfully, that has not been my experience. It's been absolutely extraordinary. I wonder if some of that fear comes from uh, the fear of being challenged. Because mm. we know, you know, artists are extraordinarily, uh, mm. how shall I say this nicely? Uh, they they can have quite narrow, quite quite strong blinkers, uh, and I think particularly when we are talking about ecological issues, um, opinion seems to be more important than fact. So uh, quite often I've been in um, you know uh, sessions where we uh, we we have scientists working um, with artists, and the scientists will say, "No, actually, you are totally wrong about that." Wow. And that challenge, um, that challenge is often not well received. Um, and the, one of the problems is we can't do that back. So we can't, we very often can't say to, to an engineer or a scientist, no, you're completely wrong about that, even though they might be. Um, 
So it's a, there's some very interesting uh, kind of um, dialectic that happens. So you when you're in a, when you're in uh, in collaborative, and that's one way of breaking the you know breaking away from the the bubble. Uh, is first of all, if you don't, if you're not ready to completely go outside your bubble, um, uh, work with some other people, work in a teamwork, do some collaborative working, challenge your own practice, and challenge your own beliefs, and see where you go. I, I think that's a one of the good things about being an artist. Um, you know, certainly a professional artist, I would say, is the fact that you are trying to constantly push your boundaries. You are constantly trying to move forward. But we are the sum of our history. You know, you do. It's almost like um, generally the work that we're doing is is evolution rather than revolution. It's it's very often that I I can't attribute back to something I've done in the past. Now, you know, there is a point where you've come to this because of what you've done before. I think it's probably the same with science and people in research worlds. You know, you're just you're just building on the knowledge that always gets you to that edge and keep moving the edge a little bit further, perhaps. And maybe that's the same with the practice. I think we're always inquiring or poking our head just around the corner, just around that next corner again, just to see what's there and what you can take from that and what you can use that for to actually um, spread out wider and spread your message, whatever message you're trying to get across a bit wider. There's a couple of comments in the chat about um, hierarchies of knowledge and sometimes scientists being given more space and uh, um, probably money as well than artists um, and also whether your research is narrow-minded or you want to be open to a shared experience. So, so Edwina. Edwina. Um, I think there are two points on this. I think those collaborative relationships can become problematic when artists are kind of brought in to illustrate or scenario mm. build, particularly with climate change. Um, and I think that visualization thing is also, there are issues. I, I did some peer reviewing for um, NERC and HRC. There's there this big bid to do with the trees. And one of the things that did distress me, I thought it was a really interesting bid, but the artists were not part of the core research team. They weren't guys. <laughs> they were put on the side and they were doing a really, really important role, which was basically hearts and minds visualization. But so why weren't they part of that core team? Was my that was my feedback to them basically. Um, that's that's very interesting because we are in on two bids on that, and we were we're new to this kind of world, and we didn't feel we had the the box to stand on. Well, to no, it in actually, way. if you're not affiliated with an yeah, academic yes, institution, you're not say. allowed to be. Not on allowed to be, team, yeah. And then yeah. you're judged for not being on the core team. Yeah. yeah. So so there's a lot of systematic systemic issues that are at stake in terms of how teams can be built up and also some exciting things that happen outside of academia as well as within you know because rules can be broken and worked around but um things don't often happen without funding so the you know it, there's there's a way to go with shifting how opportunities are, are created so this that kind of leads me to another question sorry richard was just because we don't know who's in the audience there may be some artists who haven't worked with in research worlds or within academic institutions if they feel minded what what kind of processes might they have to go through do you think to start knocking on the door you know how do they get into this world where there is funding still you know there are some great projects out there and there are some brilliant scientists and ideas through NERC and AHRC sorry about the acronyms everybody uh, but there are there is work for artists to be doing out there how do they knock on the door how do they get in if they want to uh, uh I think if there, there are there are so many answers to that question Rob but um I think artists who, who want to genuinely come into the research world and that's what we're talking about here uh, need to be able to show that they're engaging with knowledge, actually wisdom. I, li I like Edwina's word much better. Uh, that, there, that there's a level of a level of engagement with that that's, that's beyond simply making. Um, because if you are coming into a research process, you're engaging with the world of ideas. You're not simply um, you're not simply making. Um, and I think you need to be able to demonstrate that. You need to be able to evidence that either verbally or in or, 
as is usually accepted in academia in writing. So, and I think, you know, there's, that's one big step that uh, people, uh, people are often very uh, afraid of taking um, because it looks fearsome. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's not, it's not actually, but. Well, I mean, I suppose it's not the preferred medium for everybody as a way to communicate. So it can be a barrier. Um, but just taking the, the conversation one step more with that, with that idea of involvement in science, even if that's not in an academic setting, but science with a either a very big S or a tiny S, as in everything that's going on around us all the time. Um, I know that both of you um, and, and us as well, we like to engage with wider communities and allow other people who perhaps don't step into those worlds to have a chance to, to learn about them. Um, and Edwina, I know you wanted to say something about communities and participation within art projects or, or art happenings and, and what value there is in that in the context of environmental learning. I've, uh, I'm of the belief that expertise is really important, but you know, this, this academic, you know, PhD expertise is, is wonderful, but I've always viewed that everybody has, is an expert in something. You know, I often work in, with communities that I don't live in. In fact, I always work with communities that I don't live in. And they are experts in place. They know the place inside out. I'm just a visitor. Mm. I kind of regard myself as like a spider in a spider's web. And those, 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 that web is made of conversations often. Um, and this, the spider eventually retreats, but the web is still kept in place. And that conversation continues after the artist has been. But it really, I've, I've often said that actually so many of my projects the conversation happens because something needs to be made, whether it's a temporary or a permanent piece of artwork. But actually, the real artwork, the real nub of it, is actually the conversation that takes place with everybody. Oh. And these different levels of expertise, and I, I really do like working with that kind of that breadth of expertise. You know, I work with biodiversity ex experts in Glasgow but I also worked very, very closely with the local community, not least of which is that um, if I hadn't, the artwork probably would have been vandalised. Mm. And if you're making artwork in the community, you have a, a responsibility to kind of um, ask them what they want mm. rather than impose something because you have this hat on that says artist. So you you kind of brought in that word conversation, things like that. I think a strong part of what we do is relationships. It's how we interact with other people, how comfortable we are to have those challenging conversations sometimes with, you know, without talking about hierarchies, you know, with scientists, with people who are collecting their data in, in, in their offices or sometimes in the real world, but also the people who are really attached to the ground. So we can be for want of a better word, fulcrumatic. That's probably not a real, real world. So you swing <laughs> between both worlds in a way where you're you're listening to to the data and the information, but you're listening to the real world experience on the ground about what's happening in a place. And that can also, as we've talked about in the past, include the the elements, include the other than human, can include the the waterfalls, the the trees that are growing in a space, all that to try and bring it together in a form of um, data of the heart, essentially. So, you know, this, th those relationships are crucial. You know, without those, everything just is like a house of cards, really. I have a good, a good story, which I, I, if you allow me two minutes, I will tell. Yeah, go for about, it. About expert, <laughs> about expert knowledge that we forget. Um, and there was a certain university in Ireland, which I won't name, uh, that of course, it was originally built during the English occupation. So it had a great big statue of Victoria up on the, you know, up on the roof kind of thing. Um, and after uh, Ireland became independent, the first thing they wanted to do was remove Victoria. So they took her down, couldn't quite bring themselves to smash her up. So they buried her. Right. So Victoria has been buried there. And finally, as, as things evolve and they do, uh, some higher up decided it was time to put, get Victoria back. But nobody knew where she was. <laughs> so 
they brought in all these experts. They had X-ray, uh, you know, kind of X-ray uh, surveys and all kinds of things. They probably spent a for small fortune bringing in all these experts to try and find Victoria. Um, nobody thought to ask the head gardener, mm -hmm. who'd been there since he was 14 and was now 70, and knew exactly where she was buried <laughs> because he bloody well helped dig the hole. <laughs> uh, so eventually somebody did think about asking him and, and he said, yeah, she's over there. <laughs> but I think what that illustrates is that we, we, you know, we forget that everybody's an expert in something. Yeah. Uh, and that includes that includes the uh, the other species that we don't see who are extremely expert in their own world building that we forget about. We we often destroy their worlds because we don't think about asking them how it should be managed. Yeah, and that that's a very important issue is the the asking and the permission and the listening when it comes to languages that we find it much more difficult to understand because they're not they're not human. Um, also, so we've talked a lot about learning and listening and appreciating these different perspectives and even thinking to ask the obvious people or players in, in an environment. Um, so when you're working with, with communities or participation, um, the other side to, to learning and gathering wisdom and forging relationships is, is what you do with that. And um, Rob and I have referred to activism through art uh, whether that's gentle or or very strong in protest. Um, and I wondered what both of you think about the role of artists as activists in terms of the environmental crisis. I came to the conclusion about halfway. My PhD was not meant to be about climate change. Um, and I, I did it in your part of the world. I, I, I was based at Grisdale with the Forestry Commission. Um, but it just kept on hitting me in the face. You know, I arrived in Cumbria and there'd been the floods through the winter. And it just, I couldn't run away from it. And I realized, you know, I think Rob, you mentioned sitting on the fence. It's just like, my bum was getting very sore for sitting on the fence. <laughs> and, and I realized that I had to take a stance. But again, part of the PhD was about what, what's artist agency about dealing with different difficult issues without alienating the audience. Um, and collaboration was one of the recommendations. Metaphor, metonym, storytelling, I think are really powerful. And I think the world around us is extraordinarily beautiful. Um, we can allow it to speak, you know, using this digital technology, if you will. Um, because one of the things about Whiston's Wood that's interesting is that it looks like, I mean, it's owned but, um, by many people, actually. It looks like humans might not be able to get in there in the future because we're doing so much damage. It's that the entirety of it's going to be fenced off. So then artists kind of do become those archivists in the sense, you know, it's rather like the kind of virtual iterations and match you picture because people, you know, people are treading all over it. So they're just only letting a few people in and doing Google Maps of it. I, I completely agree with Edwina. I think I'm very troubled by that word well, activist because I'm not quite sure what it means but it it, it has uh, a general feeling of uh, well sitting on the m25 okay there's a there's an active uh, there is an activist act um a disruptive act so i think if i think generally i equate the word activist with being disruptive um but for me i think the most powerful art is indeed that which is a gentle persuader so, you know, we use, we either use beauty, we draw attention to beauty, we reach people's hearts much more powerfully than reaching their minds. Because so often attempting, attempts to reach the mind fail. I mean, look at the language around climate change. It has been a, an abysmal failure. Uh, and the particular the scientific language has been a total failure. What's uh, what's brought people's minds to attention 
uh, is the emotion of the emotion of seeing the world collapse, the climate collapsing around us. You know, so facts become self-evident. But I think artists can do an awful lot there in in drawing attention to those things. And but for me, it's not by getting out a great big sledgehammer and and knocking people over the head with it. It's um, it's much more about poetics. Yeah, I remember. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, definitely. That speaks to my core belief, which is however rational or informed we feel we might be. And no disrespect to the data analysts and the scientists, because that is all very, very important to understand that stuff. But ultimately, we don't make a decision based on what we know. We make all our decisions based on what we feel. Mm. I believe that very strongly. Yeah, and I think uh, Oliver Ellison, he brought some giant icebergs into to London. He, I think he did it in a few places around the world, uh, maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago, and placed them outside the Tate, and people could witness these icebergs melting over a period of a few weeks. And, you know, the videos I've seen of people just going up to it and putting their nose on an iceberg. And then you've got the explanation about what was happening. And I, I, I think you're right, it's that touching with that emotional nerve to actually feel an iceberg that's been brought uh, from, from north of Greenland, I think is a really powerful way of, of, of getting people to think about what, what's happening out there. Because it's hard, you know, we can't live in Greenland, um, mm. we, but we can get a sense of an iceberg. But I think that's to do with it. This, I'm just looking at the conversation. Just I know, my, some great yeah. things. Um, I think witnesses are really key, important uh, element in this to actually work with tangible things as well. Um, and I've, I like the word art activator rather than art activist. It yeah. takes yeah. politics out, but it, does, it means you're being proactive. Good word. Like that. You're great with language, Edwina. I love it. You always, every time we have a conversation, you come up with a word that I thought, okay, I'll have that one. <laughs> yeah, I think people, <laughs> I think people who are coming up with phrases like data of the heart shouldn't be uh, calling out other people for being brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Richard. So we're, we're kind of drawing to the end of our allotted time. Um, which is a shame because it's a really lovely conversation. I hope everybody else who's been sitting on the sidelines has enjoyed listening. Um, there has been conversation going on in chat, which I think everybody else will have been much more able to look at than we have. Um, so I am do apologize if we've missed anything. There Should was, we need to put our email address? On yes, the I will put our personal email at the bottom. So if you want to ask us a question, um, you can. And if you would like to do the same, um, if you'd like to be contacted, Richard and Edwina. Yeah, just put that in there as well. I'll put um, my website up. Yes, um, and somebody asked if there was a translation of the Welsh poem, um, and I think that's on our website. So, and if it's not, please do email me and I'll send that through. That was uh, one take Gareth, we call him. He was uh, a farmer we spent <laughs> a few days with. He was attaching the, uh, the sensors to the back of sheep so they could wander around. So in real time, scientists could work out where they were peeing. That was uh, to do with measuring soil quality and water quality in the River Conway. Yeah. But and actually, far farmers are a great example of yeah. combining nature so with art. <laughs> they know so much, yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah, so... Um, That's been great. I could, I could when can we meet again? <laughs> <laughs> I love talking to other creative types um, and people from the academic world. I think that's how things move along. It's by having these collaborative conversations and finding out what everybody else is up to. It's just about being curious, really, isn't it? Being, being a bit nosy and trying to, trying to work out how the, all the bits can come together to move everything forward. Yeah, we feel quite thing. comfortable being entangled. Um, and it's, it's kind of a good outcome of the festival and all the other relationships that have grown as part of that the whole fellowship program which has involved probably as many as 100 people um so uh yes you can carry on the conversation on twitter and um and keep looking at the website i think that's coming through from will um so i'll say thank you very much to everybody and do you want to give a closing thought either of you two no i think we've we've had plenty of thoughts i'm i'm done, <laughs> done <on thinking. laughs> it's time to be here <laughs> Uh, Will, could you do me one favour? Um, Harriet and I have been involved in making a film with a, a wonderful cellist called Sarah Smout. 
And I think the preview went out this evening. So we made a film of her. She's done a song as part of the Entangled Festival uh, in response to the overall uh, project, basically. So she's written this very, very uh, beautiful song, played the cello, and we recorded a film of her on Haitian Beach about two or three weeks ago. So if we can put that on the, the chat, do I do um, implore you, if that's a good word, to go check out the, uh, the wee film and, and, and see what Sarah has to say about in town. But it is, it is joyous. It yes, is beautiful. and please do um, as well go onto the website and have a look at the work that Daksha was referring to because you'll appreciate the dynamic nature of what she was doing there. Um, and there's also a dance piece um, that will be appearing soon. Um, and I think and, Ellie and Cheney's generally stay in the touch. Ellie well. Cheney, I think you're here somewhere. Um, Ellie's done some beautiful work as well. So hi, Ellie. You can plug your work if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got the Nintendo Switch on in the background, so probably won't be very helpful. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> but thank you. It's all on the website. Um, please do spend time and, and have a look, everyone. And thank you again for coming. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks, Will, for, for hosting us. Thanks very yeah. much. Thank you. All right. Good Take night, care guys. And good night, everyone. Yeah. Good evening. Mm -hmm.